Hi, I'm Jeff Hester. I'm an artist at Harmonix. And welcome to the talk, Maximizing Critique, Improving Communication for Everyone Involved in Critical Feedback. Conversations that involve critical feedback are part of our everyday lives as video game developers. This talk is in the art track, and I'm an artist, and most of the examples we'll be using are art. Our art. But the top things I'll be covering are relevant across all disciplines and in between all disciplines. The conversations that we have that involve giving each other feedback happen all over and everyone in all of our companies. And um, one thing that we can do as artists is we often have come from a background in art school where these kinds of conversations have been a really integral part of our education. Um, and I hope that the talk today is going to give some, even for artists, some fresh insight on some strategies we can do to improve the ways we give and receive critical feedback, or at least articulate what we already might be doing intuitively, having come through art school. Um, but one thing we can also do, those of us who are artists who have this background, is we can really use that background as to be leaders in our own uh, companies in, in help, helping to change company culture and improve this kind of uh, dialogue across and in between all disciplines. So hopefully I'll be giving you some, some, uh, some fuel and some, some, uh, some strategies that you can do to do that. Um, when conversations that involve critical feedback go well, um, our products get better, we increase efficiency, we increase team cohesion, but when those conversations go poorly, then they result in wasted work, a drift in creative vision, and just really bad team morale. And by badly, I don't mean what we normally think of as just bad. You know, I don't mean somebody saying, you know, that sucks. I mean, we know that's bad feedback. But I mean, there's often a lot of times that feedback is just okay, or it's neutral, it's, and it's not being as effective and actionable as it can be. And we're going to talk about that a lot today. How do we take feedback that's all right and make it awesome? So my, my background interest in this goes pretty far back. Uh, before I worked in, uh, in video games, I taught for a long time, for more than 10 years, um, and in China and in uh, the Rodin School of Design and at the New York Academy. I've also taught a lot of workshops at places like the Metropolitan Museum, Fisher Price, Turbine, and Harmonics. And during this time of teaching, I became really interested in the idea of critical feedback and, and group critiques and how, how it is that we give, give, give feedback. When is it effective and when is it not? And a lot of that came out of my own challenges to do it well and when it went bad, when it, when it went well, and trying to take those moments and find out what it was about them that was either good or bad. Um, and about seven years ago, I was fortunate enough to start working at Harmonics which is an awesome company. I can't say enough great things about it. Um, and one of the great things about Harmonix is it has an amazing culture of critical feedback, especially in the art department. And I found that the, the work and thoughts that I'd done uh, as, as an artist and as a um, teacher before that really fit in really well and, and worked. it was great to, to experience that at Harmonix. Uh, while there, I've worked on Rock Band 3. Um, I was, I've been on lots of... Uh, research and development teams, especially leading up to Fantasia, where I was the lead environment artist. And more re most recently, I'm now currently working on the Harmonix Music uh, Visualizer, Harmonix Music VR. Um, so while I was teaching, one of the things I would often talk about with students is this word crit. What the hell does that mean? And I would say to them, especially when they're freshmen, we say, okay, we're going to have a crit today. We talk about that. Well, what is that? And the freshmen often didn't know. They often didn't know. Does it mean criticize or does it mean critique? And there's a big difference between those two things. And we start to talk about it. What is the difference? What is the difference between criticize and critique? Well, criticize is much more superficial. It's your initial response. It's the first response you might say. It often tends to be more about personal preference. It often tends to be very judgmental. It's not, it's just what happens to come out. And it's much more on the surface. Whereas critique is about taking something apart, analyzing it, looking at it from all levels, looking inside of it, understanding how it works. And that might lead to judgment, it might lead to assessment, in terms of is it working well or is it not working well, but that assessment is not the main part of critique. The main part of critique is the analysis. So critique is more objective, it's analytical, it's reflective, it's deeper, it's going into the surface of something, understanding for what it is. And often, when feedback is not as helpful or as actionable as it can be, it's because it's living on that, that, that realm of just being something that's, uh, that someone's just criticizing. But when it becomes more, more actionable, it's heading into being more critique. 
One of the unique things about this talk today is I'm not going to just focus on how we are more effective in giving feedback, but I'm also going to talk about a lot of strategies for how we can receive feedback more effectively. You know, often, any bit of feedback you get, it might be this nasty old lump of coal, but you, you don't have to leave it that way. Just because it came that way, you, there are ways you can take that nasty lump of coal and turn it into a diamond, and I'm going to try to give you some strategies to help start thinking about ways to do that. Um, often when we think about feedback, we think about it being a one-way street, the giver going right to the receiver. And one thing that's really problematic with this is often people think that I don't need to think about the person who's receiving this feedback. It's their fault if they can't understand it. They need to have a tough skin. And you know what? That's bullshit. You know, because feedback is, these feedback loops are moments when we can really have a deep conversation and build community in our companies. And if we're not thinking about it as a two-way street, if we're thinking about it just as a one-way loop and we're not really caring about the person who's receiving it, then we're missing a huge opportunity to build relationships in the company and, and build our, our, our whole um, creative environment. But when you start to think of it as a two-way street, you can start to think about it empathically. If you're giving feedback, how are you thinking about how it's going to be received from the person receiving it? If you're receiving feedback, how are you thinking about it from the, from the person who's giving it? You know, are you going to assume it's the best intentions? Are you, going to, are you, are you not going to assume the best, best intentions? So we need to have empathy on both ends of this and see it as a two-way dialogue that we're really working together toward a common good. Before I get to a few strategies, um, goals are one of the most important things we can think about when we're giving critical feedback. If you remember nothing else I talk about today, none of the specific strategies I'm going to go over, just remember this, if you have a goal, if you, if you articulated your goal when you're about to start giving or receiving critical feedback, right away you're going to start heading more into a form of critique rather than just criticizing, because having that goal is going to help you be dugging under the surface of what you're doing. I'm going to give you a few examples of the kinds of goals that I was keeping in mind when, I, when I'm designing the strategies we'll talk about today. The first one is align your work with the art direction. This is a great default goal to have. You know, if you're not sure what goal to have, just think about this one. Because right away, you're going to start giving a context. You're going to be contextualizing the feedback you give and giving it some sort of larger uh, reason for being that's going to help it be much more relevant and much more actionable. Um, leave room for creative problem solving. This is a great goal for helping that two-way dialogue. If you're, if you're leaving room for the person you're giving feedback to solve the problem creatively, then you're, uh, then you're already inviting them into the problem. You're thinking of it more as a dialogue rather than a one-way street. Uh, encourage team spirit and cohesion. Keep that in mind with critical feedback, and things will really be helping to make sure your feedback is, is being effectively received. Um, and developing a desire for feedback. This is true of both receiving and giving feedback. It, it helps us to embrace it as a, as, a, as a wonderful act, not this moment we have to fear. You know, um, you know, they used to have this, these uh, pillows at RISD that people would sit on. They would say, you know, crit happens. It was, like, it was just, just, just furthering this culture that crit was bad. Oh, crit, it happens. And no, crit doesn't. Yeah, yeah, crit happens. It's awesome. It's this wonderful moment of, of working together, sharing. It's a great time, not something to be avoided or, or not look forward to. And becoming a valuable team member, going in with that kind of goal also will really help to right away, get you, you'll start to find your own strategies. Your own strategies will intuitively rise up if you're keeping some of these goals in mind or if you're just having a goal in general that you have in mind. So let's get down to it. Let's start talking about some strategies. Uh, some first, some strategies for giving feedback. I'll talk about two of them today. Uh, the first one is define problems before solving them, right? That's very often, we, the first thing we say is we start presenting a solution. You know, make that red. You know, or move that over there. Those are solutions. And it becomes, they're not as actionable as they could be if you define the problems. Let's look at an example of that uh, in action. Let's look at the development of the early uh, Rock Band 1 head style. This, the Rock Band 1 head style went through a major uh, course correction or change in its style. If we look at the earlier version, we can uh, th think about or imagine some of the less effective solution-based feedback that could have been said about this. For example, it might be said, the head should be more anatomically correct. What's wrong with that? That's not going to hurt anybody's feelings. That's not, is that bad feedback? It's not effective feedback. It's not effective feedback because it's presenting the solution to the problem, not presenting the problem itself, right? As an artist, what are you going to do with this? Well, I can, I can make it anatomically correct, but how? In what way? There are a lot of ways to make something anatomically correct. I don't know because I don't know what the goal is. I don't know what problem I'm really trying to solve. Another example, you know, add more hard edges. Yeah, okay. I could do that. I could start slapping in some hard edges, but I don't know why. I don't know what problem I'm trying to solve. So these are solutions being presented. What's the problem? That's a good way of rephrasing this as more problem-focused feedback. 
We need to create heads that are more anatomically correct, but still united by a common, iconic style that fits the rock band world. How can we do that? Now, one, let's make a couple comments about this. One, it's longer. Yeah, it's longer. No, so you might, I got, it's a lot more efficient for me to say the other stuff. You know, the other stuff is shorter. I want to be right to the point. I want to be direct. You know what? Yeah, you'll be efficient. You'll be direct right now. But then you might be not as efficient when the artist doesn't really have a clear goal and you have to go through a lot more iterations and it's a lot unclear. So sometimes effective feedback is longer. It's just, just part of it comes with it. But the overall process becomes much more efficient and much more, uh, uh, much, it works better. Um, we is a great word to use. You know, want to incorporate the things, make people brought into the common problem, relating it to the art style as it's done here, bringing it to the common rock band world, and ending with this question, how can we do that? An invitation to come in and solve this together. This is something we're all working on. Um, is really helps to improve that feedback. And, and in this case, those kinds of dialogues really produced this wonderful, wonderful head that became this great icon uh, for rock band itself and really helped um, the whole brand. Uh, another strategy... Describe reasoning before ju behind the judgments. Um, often we just present, in, in the same way, we often just present a solution to the problem rather than describing the problem. It's often, often common for us to just to, to tell say our judgment. You know, I don't like that. That's too red. That's too hot. That's too. Instead of spending some time asking ourselves what is underneath that judgment, and that might be reasons. It might be by, by describing the experience that's underneath it. Um, and let's look at some examples to get at this. Get at this. We'll look at uh, a few different iterations of the Rock Band 4 main menu screen. Um, uh, this is the one of the first early iterations of this. Um, and let's look at some examples of judgment face fo focused feedback. So feedback is focusing on judgment. So what well, someone might say, you know, the composition sucks. Well, I think we all agree that's bad feedback, right? Obviously, that's not going to be effective at making someone work. It's going to be really effective at pissing somebody off and really messing the whole Company, you know, communication up and messing your relationship up. It's not going to be effective. However, look at this. The composition is weak. Well, that's not so bad, right? That's not, that's not really maybe going to hurt my feelings. It might hurt my feelings a little bit. I don't feel, so feel attacked. But you know what? It's not, it's, it might not be so bad, but it's still not effective. It's still not effective because it's being presented as a judgment. The underlying experience or reasons behind that judgment aren't being express, expressed. Why did you compose the band that way? This is a great example of focusing on the artist rather than the art, Right? Every once in a while, we need to do this. Every once in a while, we have to ask, you know, why did you do this? What's going on here? But be really careful about that. If it can be rephrased in a way that's not focusing on the artist, but focusing on the art, it's probably going to be more helpful. The other thing about this, in addition to focusing on the artist, is it's also a judgment. It's kind of a veiled judgment. You know, you, you, really, you really fucked this up. You screwed this up. You know, what, what, what's wrong with you? And it's just a judgment. Not only a judgment about the art, but now it's a judgment about the artist. You know, and that's not going to... It's not, not as effective as it could be. So all of these bits of feedback are various levels. Some are more benign, some are really more harsh. But what they all share in common is that they're all judgment being presented in different ways. So how can that become much more effective? How can it become much more actionable, the same kinds of ideas? Well, one thing you could do is you could describe the experience that led to that judgment. So for example, I might look at this and say, you know, gosh, my eyes just wander all around this thing. I, I, have, I have no sense of primary or secondary focal point, and, and then my eyes just get locked on that white uh, light shape on his shirt. It's like a prison. I, I, it's locked, and I, my eyes can't get away from that. You know? And what's, what's happening there is I'm describing my experience. I'm describing my experience that led to the judgment. There's a little bit of an irony here, right? We, on one hand, we want to be more objective and good feedback, but here I'm using subjectivity. I'm using my experience. But I'm doing it very differently. Notice, you notice. I'm not using my, subject, my personal preference in terms of subjectivity. I'm just saying, you know, I like chocolate. I don't like vanilla. Not that kind of subjectivity. I'm using my experience to help get at an objective issue in the work. I'm describing my experience. And by describing my experience, we can start to get at things. Another thing starts to come out here. You can start to see now there's some criteria that the artist can hold on to, right? Primary and secondary focal points. That just has kind of bubbled up by describing experience, right? Because now we have a, something now the artist can hold on to. It's, oh, I see. That now I understand the kind of experience I need to create by working on this composition. And so now, as I go back into it to improve it, now I'm excited because now not only do I see the problem because I understand it, but I understand that the real thing I want to do is create an experience, and I understand what kind of experience I want to create. I'm going to dive back into it, and oh, I'm really excited to get to work. And here's the next iteration. You can see now we've got some nice primary, secondary focal points. I can see like, the, uh, the guitar player then leading back into, you know, my eyes are really led around from the red to back into the blue, starting to get some of that. But we can also do another round now of, um, of iteration and another round of judgment-focused feedback. So let's see, what was another judgment we can place now on this? On this? You can say, 
Ah, that's a poor use of camera angle. Another example of judgment. Not really bad. It's not going to really hurt my feelings that you said that. So this isn't about necessarily hurting feelings. It's not about critique that is often obviously bad, but it's about often critical feedback that's not as effective and actionable as it could be. Because how is this actionable? Right? Well, I guess I could change the camera angle. But I'm not really, what, what do you mean by camera angle? Uh, I'm not sure what, I can start playing around with it, randomly putting camera angles in, but I'm not sure because I don't know what the problem is you're trying to solve, right? And I don't know, I don't know exactly where this judgment came from. So maybe we could rephrase that and make it some more effective reason-focused feedback. So instead of focusing, in this case, on the experience that led to the judgment, you can focus on the reasons that led to that judgment. So maybe you want to say, you know, the composition as a whole should feel more as energetic as the characters. Adding tilt to the camera might help. What are some other ideas? Let's dissect that a little bit. So it begins with the reason behind the judgment, right? And it, it takes something internal to it. Now we, have a, now we have some criteria we can use as the artist goes into it. They have this criteria. They want to make things energetic, right? Um, it does present a solution here, right? Which is something I suggested earlier not to do. Adding some kilt to the camera might, camera might help. But the difference here now is this being, the, the solution is being presented as an option, as an example. You know, adding some tilt to the camera might help. Where are some others? You can incorporate people, bring them into this discussion, right? Well, we can't always do that. We can't always do this, right? There's often times in the production pipeline, we just don't have time for group discussions. We're really busy. We've got to get this done. This is due tomorrow. It has to happen. I'm the art director. I know what this needs to happen. I've been working on this for years. Here's what needs to happen to solve this. What do you do in that case? Do you just tell them? Here's, you need to tilt the camera angle. Do it that way. That's an option. Another option, which is kind of in the middle, which is, I think, much more effective and actionable, is to often reason focus feedback that still has the reasons behind it. So the composition as a whole needs to feel more energetic. Adding some tilt to the camera will help. So did not, don't just say add tilt to the camera, but why does that camera need to be there? What's the reason behind that? So that way the artist has that criteria to, to, that they'll know when they're fixing it, what, when it's going to be good. What are they trying to achieve by doing this? So they have the sense of it, and, and they can feel empowered then. Even if not, they're not empowered to, to come up with their own solution, they're at least empowered to understand whether the solution they're doing is right or not, because they understand the criteria that's, under, that's underneath it. And in this case, we ended up with this awesome composition on the Rock Band 4 main menu screen. Um, so those are a couple strategies for giving feedback. Um, defining problems rather than solving them. Describing reasons rather than just the judgments or also giving the experience behind the judgments. And they're so fairly simple. They're fairly basic. But if these things are so basic and simple, why do I always screw this up? I've been thinking about this a lot as a teacher, as an artist for a number of years, a video game company. I, I'm engaged in critical feedback every day. I still, to this day, often judgments come out, solutions come out. Why is this so hard? It's, why is this deceptively simple and actually fairly difficult to do? It's because it actually involves two steps. Right? We first, we have to recognize what our first response is, as our intuitive gut response, and stop it or catch it after it's come out of our mouth and, and, and add on to it. So first we have to re recognize our first response, and then we have to reflect and rephrase. So we have to catch what that is, and we have to think about it, and we have to rephrase it to become more effective. That makes it really difficult. It's also the case when we're receiving feedback. When we're receiving feedback, we'll go into some strategies for that now, we also have to often stop ourselves from our initial response, which is tending to be pretty defensive. Oh, no. Oh, I already thought about that. Oh, being defensive and putting that first response down and then going into the receiving of the feedback. Um, here's some strategies that can help us do that. The first is to ask questions that encourage critics to define the problems or describe the reasoning. So basically, these are the same strategies I talked about before, but in this case, you're on the receiving end of it. So when the person giving you feedback isn't phrasing their feedback as defining problems or they're not phrasing it as describing the reasons, then what you can do is take that feedback, that raw lump of coal, and you can start asking questions to turn it into the diamond that's hidden inside of it. Right? Let's look at an example of that. This is a monkey. I love this monkey. This is a monkey from Disney Fantasia. Music evolved uh, from one of our scenes. It was, done, it was a, an awesome concept art by Gianna Ruggiero, and I loved it. I loved this monkey, and Gianna loved it, and we were really happy with it. But unfortunately, it wasn't fitting into some larger narrative and art direction issues, and so it's, it, it needed to be changed. And, and that was a little bit unclear for a while. And there was some you know, poorly, often poorly phrased solution-focused feedback, such as, make the monkey older. Now, if we all imagine ourselves as Gianna, you get that, we make the monkey older. So, oh, yeah. Okay, I can make the monkey old, but what, what, how? How old? I don't know. Why? What's going on? You know, it's unclear, right? So how could that be? What could you do if you're in, if you're in Gianna's position? We could start to ask questions to reveal the problem underneath that solution. What, what are the, what, 
Um, how would an older monkey fit into this scene more successfully? You know, what is it about age that's important here? You know, why an older monkey? Or, or just simply, what problem are you trying to solve with that solution? Just ask it, right? Let's look at an example of some poorly phrased judgment-focused feedback that could have uh, also about the same awesome monkey. A monkey is too goofy. Yeah, monkeys are goofy. <laughs> What's wrong with that? So, you know, okay, that's my first response. If I hear that, if, you know, if I'm Gianna, I hear, monkey, yeah, monkey. So, ooh, I'm going to stop that. That's not helpful, right? So, obviously, this bit of poorly phrased feedback has some, it's a, it's a lump of coal. It's got, what's the diamond inside? How can I get that out? I can start asking some questions. You know, okay, so let's ask some questions to reveal the, what's behind the judgment. You know, what feelings do you think the monkey should evoke? You know, what kind of feelings should people have when they're looking at this monkey? If they don't, if they don't want to make him feel goofy, what kind of feelings should be there? So we asked these kinds of questions, we got to the issue, and the real issue um, turned out to be, uh, so we asked these questions, the poorly, poorly phrased feedback was transformed through our asking of questions and finding out that really we need a monkey that fits into a narrative based on sadness, isolation, and an attempt to connect. Oh, okay. Now we can start to think, now I understand why those issues, because now we understand the problems are trying to be solved. Okay, so we've, we've taken that, that, that poorly phrased feedback, we've asked some questions, and we've transformed it into something that's really helpful, and now we can dive into it, and we end up with this awesome, awesome monkey that has this amazing sense of empathy, you, that you're, it's this, you're lost in space, you can't get to this monkey, you're trying to help the monkey. It was, uh, I love this monkey. I loved both versions of the monkey, but the, the second version of the monkey was obviously the most relevant one because it was appropriate for what we needed. Um, so another strategy for receiving feedback is frame the critique. Let's look at an example of a development of a scene from, also from Disney Fanta from Fantasia Music Evolved called The Haven. Um, and in this case, um, uh, the art lead David Badalana and, uh, and Don Rivers, the cinematographer and lighting designer, uh, knew that we had to make this scene to be much more iconic. We needed to make it different from all the other scenes we had to find a way to give it its own identity. And we had to do this really late in the, in the production process. Everything had already been made. We couldn't change any assets. So they did a great job of framing that critique when they brought it to the group so they get the feedback that wouldn't be off base, wouldn't be get feedback that was taking away from those things. So just by framing the critique, you know, based on the things I just mentioned. We need to give the scene an iconic look using the elements that already exist. So right away, you're not going to start getting feedback of, oh, change the trees. Let's get some new trees. That's not an option. So let's not waste our time getting that kind of feedback. Let's frame the critique to get the feedback that's most effective. And ended up with this awesome, really iconic looking, beautiful, beautiful scene. Third strategy for receiving feedback Look for themes in the feedback. So this is a great one if you don't have, you can't ask questions. You know, maybe somebody walked by your desk and dropped a bomb on you and walked away. You can't ask them some questions. Or, or maybe it came from the client or whoever. But for some reason, you don't, you're not in the position where you can ask questions. You're not in the position where you can frame the feedback before it happens. So this is a great strategy in those situations. And so we'll look at another scene from Disney Fantasia, Music Evolved, the nation scene. Um, this scene, I'll oh, go back one. This was a beautiful concept, work of concept art. Uh, but once we got it into the uh, rough, roughed out gray boxy, version of itself, we realized there were some problems. Um, and unfortunately, we realized those problems after the animation of the dragon coming from this mountain was already there. So the mountain was locked in place, which was a problem. So we started getting all this, this feedback when it was like, move, move the volcano back. The area between the city and the mountains is boring. Make the background trees smaller. Add some flying creatures in the forest. And, you know, we tried some of these things. Some we couldn't do. We couldn't move the mountain because we, couldn't, we didn't have time to redo the animation on the dragon. And, and we tried some of these others. We, we, we were playing with these details. But finally, what we realized we needed to do was we needed to take all that feedback and put it in a bucket and look at it across it and say, what is common with all of this? What, is, what are we being told in all these bits of feedback? And what we were being told in all of those was the common theme and the common theme was the space feels shallow. It lacks excitement. And so we started thinking, well, what can we do? How can we change that? And we came up with the idea, we can't change depth because we can't move that mountain, but we can't change it in Z, but we can change it in Y. Let's just drop the floor. And suddenly we can have this big, vast space that feels vast. You can see through it now, so it feels like it's deeper. But even though it's not deeper, you can see back for there. And also now we can um, put, the, put the dragon on this ledge that feels floating in space. So we don't really understand its depth anymore. So it solved a lot of bunch of problems. But we didn't get there until we looked at the themes running across all that critique and started to deal with them as a group rather than trying to deal with each bit of feedback one-on-one, one-on-one on, one on, one on its own. So let's just kind of recap the strategies I've talked about over the last uh, 20 minutes. 
Um, first were strategies for giving feedback and describing the problem rather than solving it, and describing reasons or experience that lead to judgments. Um, and also the strategies for receiving feedback, You're asking questions, focusing the critique, looking for themes. Um, one other thing I'll add to one of these is when you describe reasons or experience, or when you ask people to describe the reasons or experience, it also helps to reveal sometimes if something someone has said is purely uh, personal. Let me give a quick example of that. Which, like, say, you've, say you've got a horror, a horror game, and so feedback somebody gives you is, you know, oh, oh, I really don't like that character, or that character is really not good. And you say, well, or, you know, that character makes me feel bad. And you say, well, well what, what's, tell me about the experience you're having with that character that, that led to that led to that judgment. Oh, gosh, every time I see her, she, she scares the hell out of me. Well, so obviously it's a case where that's good. You want that character to scale the hell out of you, right? And this is just an obvious and simple example of what often can happen, which is sometimes someone gives you a piece of judgment or they give you something and they think it might be criticism, but once you start to dig underneath it, you find actually it's not. It might, might be awesome. And it's a great example of times where when you're receiving feedback, don't even immediately re- react to it. Dig underneath it to find out what's really there, because it might actually be awesome. It might be that it's great. Um, same thing, too, when somebody says something really nice to you. Oh, I love that red you've used. In that case, my initial, re- feedback is, my, my initial response is to go, oh, thank you, that's great. But instead, that, that's still a lump of coal, because I can't do it's not actionable yet. Right? So you say, I love that red you've used. Oh, what is it about the red you, that you love? How is it functioning? You ask some questions, dig underneath both the good feedback and the difficult feedback to really get the stuff underneath it, and it becomes much more actionable. Um, Takeaways that I think would be helpful from, for today, the things I would hope that you could take away from this, uh, this brief chat about critique. First, clearly define your goals. If you understand what you're doing, it really, really help to make the, what you're saying deeper and not just so much on the surface. Focus on critique and not just criticizing. So take things apart, examine them. Don't just have comments of what go on the surface. Remember that all criticism is potential critique. The examples I was just giving. You know, even if someone says a nice thing to you, it makes you feel good. Even if somebody, it all can be potentially good, and you want to try to find the information underneath it and make it actionable. And then recognize, reflect, and rephrase. Try to stop yourself from saying what initially you might say. Think about how it's going to be effective, and think about how rephrasing it in some effective ways. And remember that our first reactions are often really poorly phrased and not as helpful as they could be. So those are some of my ideas for critique. And I've been thinking about this a long time, and I love thinking about this kind of stuff. I still struggle with it. Um, and I am mostly interested in the conversation itself. And I just, this is an invitation. Please, if any of you are also interested in thinking about this, shoot me some emails, hang out afterwards. I would love to hear your stories. I'd love to hear your strategies. You know, these are some strategies I've come up with. There's lots of others. Um, and um, we'll have a few minutes for questions. But also afterwards, if, if you don't feel like doing questions, you just want to have a chat, I'll be in the wrap-up room because I'd really like this to be the beginning of a larger conversation about this. I think it's something that is really important for our, for our, for our industry to really focus on. And many of us do it great, but it'd be great if all of us could do it even better, and especially across disciplines. I think finding ways to make this interdisciplinary would be really awesome. Thank you all very much. So how do you deal with a lead or an art director that says the dreaded three words, I don't know, to any of your questions? First of all, that's an awesome art director. There's an aside. It it is, because they're not going to lie, right? Um, this is an aside. I, I, I've had a doctor for many, many years. One of the things I love about my doctor, Dr. Stephen Scott, if anybody happens to live in Providence, Rhode Island, and wants to find a physician, the thing I love about Stephen Scott is that he will always say, I don't know, gosh, let me look into that, instead of making some you know, bullshit up. And, and so, so, so that's the first thing. I don't know the context, but in general, someone saying I don't know is often a great thing that they're willing to say that. Um, what's the context you're thinking of in particular with someone said I don't know? Like if you have, uh, if, they, if they give you feedback and then you ask a leading question as to, oh, why do you feel that way? And they say, I don't know, full stop. Like oh. no constructive feedback whatsoever beyond the, yeah. you know, that's mm-hmm. it. Maybe, maybe ask another question. <laughs> um, like, yeah, yeah, obviously that's not going to be, also, you know, another way you can say is, you know, it's really good just... <clears throat> Say, well, I, I don't know your relationship with the art director, yeah. but somebody say, gosh, you know, that's, it's not really helpful for me. One thing that would be really helpful for me is if I could understand some of the stuff underneath this. Or you know, just kind of finding ways to kind of keep that conversation going 
Uh, is that helpful? Um, a little bit. Uh, yeah. It's, but yeah, I think it may, the other thing you can do is find the other strategies. You can start to dissect it yourself. Mm -hmm. So if they gave you something and then you ask them what made you feel that way, and you say, I, they just say, I don't know, you can take that feedback and try to put yourself in that position. It's like, okay, if this is the case, you know, if the, like looking at one of the examples I said, you know, if the camera angle needs to change, start saying, well, what is it about it that might need, make that camera need to you know, change? Right. You can try to get inside of it and you can try to imagine what the underlying reasons are. Okay, cool. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Uh, do you have any, any tips for uh, stimulating uh, a team to give more critique? Because uh, yeah. I have a team that they're all friends and, and, yeah. and they have good rela relationships. Yes. They're, they don't, they're not very comfortable uh, critiquing each other. You know? Yeah. Yes, I do. And um, yeah, and there's, there's an essay I wrote that was in a book that almost got published. I'm going to try to find a way to self publish it. That's a whole, that has a whole um, uh, bunch of, about how to do group critiques in ways. Well, I'll give you one thing that can be really helpful. And that is that often people go into a critique and they think they have to judge. And that's not true. In fact, judgment, we know this from, from playtesting, right? Playtesters give us their experience, and that's what helps us understand whether the game is working. And you can think of critique as the same way. Think of critique as a time to be playtesting the artwork or whatever it is. So you can put people in front and say, wait, let's all just talk about how, we're, how we're, we experience this work. So if it's a bunch of people, say, wait, you know, instead of them feeling like they have to judge each other, take that out of the equation, right? This isn't about judging, it's about describing. So we sit in front of you know, a work of art and say, okay, how, where are your eyes looking when you look at this? Or, or that's a leading question. Or you're going to start to say, let's go around and everyone start to just describe an experience they're having when they, when they play through this level. What's an experience you had? Um, and then people start to describe their experiences. And by describing the experiences then, we can start to say, oh, that was the experience we wanted to have, or that wasn't the experience we wanted to have. And then you can start to find out what the problems are. So you kind of bubble it up from organic experience rather than thinking you have to judge. And that's one thing I, what I taught. That's how I always did all my critiques. I would just say, okay, we're not going to judge at all. And students were like, oh, thank, what? Oh, thank God. But then they think that it wasn't going to be real critique. But that, that's what real critique is, actually. Real critique is the taking apart and analyzing. Is that helpful? Yeah, a lot. Sure. Thank cool. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I tend to find that a lot of, I tend to find a lot of the ways to really break loose on the critiquing is to create a third party separate thing that you're doing first. For, so, for example, if we're approaching a project to like look at other people's versions of the projects yeah. and where all of you are able to feel like you're safe to talk to each other because it's not somebody who's in the room, yeah. you're already getting the language going. Yeah. So, as the language gets going and then you ultimately come back around to work that you're doing or you're a little bit later in the project, people tend to feel a little more comfortable critiquing each other because they feel like they've been in the presence of hearing critiquing. That is a great point. Yeah, establishing a, a, a culture. Yeah. In which, and this is one thing that Harmonix does so well. I, I just love working at this company because Harmonix also has this great culture of giving critique. And, and we all have the dialogue for it. And we all are used to talking about each other's work. And we're, and, and, but in, if you're in a situation where that may not exist, this may relate to the previous question too, then part of what you can do, is, this is a great example, is find ways to instill dialogues about critique about something that's different. You know, bring in some other games. Have a discussion about another game. Bring in something, anything that can, you can start having, just practicing the muscles of critical feedback. It really does seem to be a factor, is the more that people are just kind of used to feeling like they can start talking to each other with negative language that at least they would think would be negative yeah. and actually be something that just spurs further conversation. I tend to find it, it's very effective. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, so my question relates to... Um... Um, some, some issues I've seen, well, within our company, we do a lot of feedbacks on game designs. Yeah. A lot of times we're doing this while we still don't have prototypes that you can play with. So we're just talking about, you know, do you think this would be fun? Do you think oh, it would be fun? Good point, yes. In those kind of situations, we had a number of times run into a lot of problems. Uh, one of them is, um, you know, if we, if, if we just come into the meeting and you get presented with it, I've noticed some people, they don't like to give critique because they're like, I'm still thinking about it. I don't know. Yeah. I've got to really think. Yeah. And so sometimes we'll say, okay, well, we send out the material ahead of time. But when we did that, what we noticed is like, just the speed at which you can think through and iterate through stuff, you know, for better or worse, just slows down a little bit. Yeah. Um, a second issue we ran into is, at least in situations like these, you know, there, invariably there's something that is subjective, right? Yeah. I just think this gameplay is fun. Yep. I just think that gameplay is not fun. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's like how do you address these kind of things where fundamentally it is a subjective opinion. Yeah, I think those, those are both great points. I'll start with the second one first. And the second one is that 
in this case, it's someone who just doesn't have practice explaining their subjectivity. And in the, because that's just not the, when you say, I, don't, I just don't like it, there's always some sort of experience underneath there that's leading to that subjective re- reaction, right? And some people just aren't good and don't have a lot of practice at explaining what that is underneath there. And that's when it just takes someone who's got kind of a, ta- a talented facilitator or, or, or pra- to start to say, okay, what is it about that that you don't like? You know, what, what, what experience? Describe, you can just pull back and say, well, describe the experience that you're having of it for me or finding ways to ask questions that start to get at that. So I think there always are kind of ways, you know, this idea of I just don't like it there's always something underneath there. There's a reason you don't like it. You, just may, not be, you, don't, you may not be able to articulate it yet. You may need some help articulating it. And that's just a, a skill-building exercise, and, and, and good facilitators can kind of help with that. Your other point about kind of giving things ahead or people not being ready, I think it's always helpful, if somebody isn't ready to, to give feedback, not to force it, because then it's, there's, that's, that's a recipe for bullshit. Because that's, that's when, and I would always say this to my students, you know, if you don't, have, if you don't know what you're going to say, slapping words on it because you feel like you have to say something is the worst thing you can do. Because that's the definition, the definition of bullshit. Right? Language that is not connected to, the, to reality. You know, just language for the sake of language. Right? And so that ability to say, um, I just, I'm not, you know, I'm just not, I, I, I am having some feelings about this here now, but I can't articulate them yet. Give me some time. So if you have to articulate the meeting, that's when a good facilitator also can help. He helps, okay, let me help you articulate it and start asking questions to try to get at what that, that is. Um, um, and um, so those are a couple thoughts. Is that helpful? Did that address your, yeah. Yes. Um, the strategies that you posted, do you feel they have to be tailored based on the experience level of an individual if you're providing uh, feedback to a junior artist or a senior artist, or do you think it's abstract enough that it could work for anyone's experience level? I think they're abstract enough to be, to be universal. I, I, yeah, I mean, this, this idea of simply you know, presenting the problem rather than just giving someone a solution, that, that works across all levels. And I mean, when I was a teacher, I was fortunate enough to teach all levels. I taught freshmen all the way up to graduate students. And these strat- I did the same stuff with everybody. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so there, was, there were different levels of depth of discussion we could have at the, the different those levels, but the strategies underneath that were, were the same. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Ryan Locke from Aberte University in Scotland, and I'd be really interested in some advice from yourself based on uh, the discussion we've just had. Um, I'm really fascinated by this area in particular because I work uh, in computer arts mostly, and I deal with students across multiple disciplines, you know, whether it's concept design, 3D graphics or design, uh, illustration. There are quite a lot of things going on there. Um, and one of my main objectives with my, my third year group in particular, so this is you know, the year before they do their final year, yeah. is to develop a community of critique. Because it's me versus a lot of students. Yeah. Often I'm the, the single point for critique or yes. feedback. Yeah. And I'm not always available or I'm busy. Yes. And that, there's, there's probably a lot of other issues there in terms of other classes and how busy they are, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But um, that idea of fostering a, a community or preparing students yes. for industry or a, even outside, well, that's not, it doesn't have to be industry, but do you have any advice in terms of uh, your experience in education and how you might help foster uh, a better community of critique in students? Yeah, I think part of it, it has to do with getting out of this idea that crit- critique is bad. Yeah. There's something to be avoided. I, 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 it's so ironic. You know, some place like, like RISD values itself on the fact that it's a great place to learn critique. And it is. I mean, RISD is an amazing school for learning critical thought. And it's, it's, it's the core of what they do. But then they'll go and do weird things. Like they'll have this crit happens like, pillow that you sit on, like making it like, oh, like, well, there's mixed messages there, right? Sending like, oh, it's, it's this bad thing we should avoid, you know? It, 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 but then we're saying, and so that part of that is just distilling that culture that this is a wonderful moment for us to be together and work together. It's about being a community and, and, and working toward a common goal. Um, so that, getting the culture right is really helpful. Um, and then also making it so that you teach people the process rather than just giving it to them. You know, rather, so it's not, you're not in a situation where the teacher's needed. You're, yeah. you're in an ideal world, you want to be teaching these students so they can go off in small individual groups and do it themselves. And when I was a teacher, that's what I would always focus on doing. And so I would give them these strategies and I would never run critiques where it was me and them. Mm-hmm. I would never run critiques. Like, okay, I'm going to I'm, I'm teach you how to critique by showing you how to do it. Because that's, 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 that's baloney, mm-hmm. right? That you just can't do it. Because that, then there, you've got to learn by doing, right? It's like virtual reality. You've got to be in it and get it, right? So, so coming up with strategies of ways of, 
you know, in th this 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 essay I wrote has a lot of these in it too. I'll try to find a way to make. Read it. Yeah, I'll try to find a way to get this out. And um, and but but the, one of the strategies was you know t going around and just having everyone first describe an objective thing about what they saw. You know, it's red. It's plaster. It's you know, it's big. It's five inches tall. It's the, you know just something objective. So we just start talking. You know, no judgment, no, no deep thought. We're just getting words to come out of our mouths. So we're kind of getting warmed up. And then doing some rounds where you start to now describe your experience. So, oh, gosh, it feels like it's going to fall to me. Oh, oh it makes me scared. Oh, it, whatever. You know, now you describe your experience. And just, you know, just going around and just starting people. And so you come up with a, a, a formula for like, okay, first you do this, then you do this. And now we go around and everyone starts to describe a way in which they think it's, it's not, work, not living up to its potential or something. So there's a strategy. And then say, okay, guys, now you know steps one, two, three of this. This process. Now, you as a small group, go over and do it there. And you as a small group, do it over there. So, um, okay. Is that five or is we're done? Okay. Um, and um, so, uh, was that somewhat helpful? The yeah, no, I was fun. I, I, I do some things already, yeah. but like, you know, you've given me a lot of great ideas, yeah. which is so important. Um, yeah. I was wondering if I could maybe just grab two minutes with you afterwards. You can grab as many minutes with me as you'd like. I'll, yeah, I'll be in the wrap up room afterwards, and I would love to talk with you more. That's and anyone cool. else that would like to have more talking. Yeah, that would be Thank wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a 3D artist that uh, is on a team of predominantly 2D artists. Yeah. And trying to get really good constructive feedback can be rather difficult because uh -huh. I often find myself kind of talking about my process and going through what I'm doing and yeah. how I'm doing it. And I often don't find that feedback that I kind of need yeah. um, coming back my way. Um, yeah. So I guess in terms of your experience, like, how would you facilitate that conversation when that there's that kind of disconnect between like what you're trying to the problems you're trying to solve and like people's experience like yeah. that process. That's rough. Yeah, I, I think one, just really thinking through me that strategy of like framing the critique and really kind of starting to think through like what are the experiences that you can try to frame. You know, so you're asking people how they're experiencing something or, or what they have, but you can kind of you find a way to kind of frame it. So you're not just putting it in front of them, because they're going to be looking at it from their point of view, but you need to kind of get them to look at it from your point of view, right? And so you can start to you know, think of yourself as a teacher. Like, you're going to be a 3D, 3D design teacher. What are the principles of 3D design that are important here? And if they don't understand them, kind of helping them understand what they are, and then asking them if they're relevant to what's there. But, but the underlying strategy there is trying to find some ways to kind of frame the critique. That's kind of what I would go about it, yeah. but you're in a rough position. Yeah, I often do that, but I find that it's often one-sided, and yeah. I feel like I'm kind of just leading the critique, and it doesn't feel quite as back and forth as I yeah, would. Yeah, well, I mean, framing it is getting it going, but once it's framed well enough, then hopefully then the, they can start coming out. But yeah, you're in a rough position with that. Sorry, I, would have, I, would, I, if you, I, I may think of some other ideas if you're around <laughs> well, there. Well, I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. I'm a 3D artist too, so I understand. You're, yeah, so if you're not thinking three-dimensional, you don't have the ability. It's hard to be in that mindset if you if you don't. There, yeah. Okay. Well, but you. creating some mock-ups or creating some prototypes that, that get at the three-dimensionality and having them experience that might be helpful. I don't know. I'm just okay. trying to throw some stuff out. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. sure. Hi, I think this will be the. I think this will be the last question. Yeah. Hi, Aleem. Uh, I'm an effects artist. Um, I was wondering on your insight or your thoughts in. Um, the process of cross-disciplinary critiquing with, like, say, designers or programmers or whoever, yeah. in regards to assets that aren't quite done, um, yeah. I feel like in our industry we have it, a, a lot of, like, to show an asset for critique is almost to take it to final. Um, yeah. And what challenges that brings to the, the emotional critiquing state, uh, and if you've ever run into that or actually solve that in any way or have insight. Yeah, that's a really rough one, too, because you know, people who aren't artists, they're looking at what's there. And when people who are artists, they're looking beyond it. They know, OK, this is an unfinished asset. I know where it's going. I can imagine it being done. But someone who's not an artist is going to see what's there. And I think that's where framing can be really helpful, too, if you kind of maybe have an image along with it. OK, here's what this will look like in the end. And here's what it looks like now. And so we're not really looking for feedback about, you know, the materials, because the materials will get to there. We're not looking for feedback about the, you know, the the this this, this these specific aspects of the effects, because they will get there. But we are looking for feedback about X, Y, and Z. So so if you have some image that allows them to get in their mind what it will look like that they can kind of superimpose onto it, then that might help to frame it. Is that is that helpful? Okay, great. Thank you all so much. I'll be uh, I'll be here for a few minutes and then over there. Thank you.